Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 28 of the Tomato Timer. Joining me today is Millie McQuillan. She's studying computer science at Durham, and she's moving on to complete her master's in advanced computer science at Cambridge on a full scholarship. Um, she's also been the recipient of the Women in Tech Scholarship, uh, and she's a huge reader, and it's so good to have her. Thank you so much for joining us, Millie. Hi, how are you? I'm very well. How are you? I'm okay. So, you know, computer science... Uh, the stereotype is there, and I don't think there's any stereotype which involves reading with it. Um, but the reason I kind of like reached out to you uh, and connected with you on LinkedIn was because I read this article um, that you posted, which said that you'd read 325 books in the three years you were at Durham. I was like, whoa, how does that even happen? And I think I'm a big reader, but like absolutely blown away. Tell me a little bit about why reading is such an important passion for you. Um, and how do you go about reading so many books? Um, yeah, so I started, um, basically I didn't read really much. I read when I was very young and then I stopped because actually I was told to stop by my teacher. I, I brought in Alex Ryder, I'm one of the Alex <laughs> Ryder books in year three. And one of my teachers was fear. I read it out loud to her, you know, when you sit and read with the teacher and yeah. she, she was like, never, you're never bringing this into school again. Um, and I think ever, ever since then, I sort of weaned off a little bit. And I was like, you know, I, I felt like I couldn't bring certain things into school. I didn't know what, because I didn't know what was wrong with Alex Ryder. Um, and then I just sort of stopped. And it wasn't until I was about 18, I watched a talk by um, a somebody who works at Facebook. And he worked like 15 hour days. Um, and he said that he'd read somewhere or, or figured out that it, around 270 books was worth, was equivalent to an undergraduate degree in knowledge. Um, and so I was like, oh, wow, because I love to learn. I love the idea of doing a million degrees. It's just too expensive. Um, so I thought, well, here's a way I can do that. And it's somewhat free. Um, so I then immediately was like, OK, I'm going to do that. And if he works 15 hour days and can read three books a week, which I think is what he said he was on at the time, um, then why can't I? Because I was commuting 10 hour days. There was no reason. I wasn't reading on the train. I was just listening to music and staring out the window. So that's kind of what what started me on that journey of reading more and ever since I kind of haven't been able to stop it it is a great <laughs> thing to do to, to take yeah. down time and especially I mean there are lots of stereotypes of computer science I feel like I probably don't really <laughs> have any of them so why not go the full way um, and so that's kind of how that all got got running I just thought well actually if this is a way to learn then I'm going to do it because I love to learn so um, yeah that's kind of where that so what does it like what is a typical kind of like day look like for you do you have a specific time during the day when you read or is it just like you pick it up whenever no oddly I've, I've never had that and I, I have a few different ways that I keep reading as much as I do because it's very easy to stop um and so for me the, my my number one tip to people and the way that I read is actually I will just go to the library because libraries there if you want to read a lot do not buy books it's too expensive um so i've got a library card down at home and up in durham and i'll take it to the the council library the added randomness of only reading well-reviewed books mm. kind of forced that a little bit um if if you don't like non-fiction well odds are you're going to like a well-reviewed non-fiction book a lot more than you're going to like a badly reviewed non-fiction book <laughs> and there are certainly some non-fiction books which they're you know they have millions of reviews that people are like this book is amazing and it, it probably is you know yes your average non-fiction book if you don't like non-fiction books you're probably not going to like and your tolerance for worse non-fiction books is going to be a lot sort of lower than your tolerance for bad fiction books um i probably do read a lot of genres at a time um usually in durham i'll read more fiction partly because the library there has a better fiction selection than my home library, but also because when I'm studying a lot and stuff, it's it's nice to escape. I wouldn't yeah. say that non-fiction books ever constitute escapism, um, <laughs> but they're great for all sorts of other reasons. They're really interesting. I like reading them on public transport. They're a lot more interesting when you're on the go and you're bored and you, know, you want something. Oh my goodness, this is so interesting. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how I'll usually, usually my Kindle books are books I, I buy or purchase like audible or kindle um those will be non-fiction because i find non-fiction i like to come back to more than fiction um so fiction i tend to just take out from the library um so i guess that generally falls yeah. that way um but otherwise there's not really any sort of recipe to how i, I do things i suppose <laughs> it's literally if it's got a good review or yeah. it's got a, a load of good reviews i'll read it 
because it's good. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. And I guess using Goodreads, you also record your whole kind of reading journey and every next book that you're reading on Goodreads. Yes, it sounds really bad, but when you read loads and loads and loads, you do forget what you've read. So there are a lot of books that I find very, very similar. I don't know why one comes to mind, predictably irrational. I can never remember if I've read it, and I have read it. <laughs> um, but it's so similar to so many other books I'm read, I've read. I'm like, oh, is that the one I have? Because there's lots of books like it that I also haven't read. Yeah. And so a lot of things kind of sit in this weird spectrum of very, very similar. And then there are lots of books that are also very, very similar to those books. Um, and so you can kind of forget and it's tricky and a good reason is a great way of doing it as well because you can set these challenges I'm sure you've seen but then it tells you how far ahead or behind you are so it it gamifies it in a it's a very very subtle way it's not overtly gamified but um, that that I find quite good for like keeping track of how much you've read and how far you know how you're doing for the year I suppose mm. um, I actually um, <laughs> weirdly enough I actually read a book uh, a couple weeks ago and then my sister was reading it again. I'm like, oh, she re-downloaded it, put it back on the Kindle. I opened it again. I read it. I got halfway <laughs> through to it. I'm like, you know, this book sounds very familiar. And I realized that I knew the plot as well. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I didn't. I just completely forgot that I'd read this book. Mm. Um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> I can completely resonate with the thing that you're saying about, like, forgetting a book. Um, and yeah. when you are when you are reading so much, um, you you definitely like need something to track it so yeah. you then um so this is the way I kind of met you was that medium article you wrote about the 12 books that every student should mm. read um so one of the questions was where where is that so we will definitely link that article for them um but the the selection of the books that you had were a mix between fiction and non-fiction but also the fictions were like a lot of classics as well and I was quite surprised um I'm a big classics person um I'm reading A Tree Grows in Brooklyn right now. It's I mean, amazing, mm. very slow, but a beautiful story. Mm. Um, but I, I never realized that that's, that would be like a, a big part of, like, especially a uni kid's journey. Well, why, why did that come up to you? Um, this sounds really, really bad, but I'm sure this resonates with a lot of people. I thought classics would be rubbish. Um, I wasn't interested in reading them because I thought, you know, having done GCC English and those are the kind of times where you read you know your classic Shakespeare and stuff and I was never interested in that I never read Shakespeare and was like wow this is amazing I'm sure for some people they understand it a lot more than I do but for me I'd always kind of thought well classics are going to be trash so I was I actually for a long time didn't read any of the classics because I just expected them to be the boring kind of books I'd read in English and that's exactly what I was trying to avoid with my particular reading journey yeah. um and I think, I mean, the one I, I remember recommending was 1984. Um, I mean, that, I think, just resonates so much for, for now and historically. And, and that was one where, I, I mean, I knew it was good. So that was one which I didn't expect to be bad. Um, there, there were other ones, like I read Dracula really recently, and I don't know why I thought that would be, you know, I just, it's, it's what, 150 years old or if, even older. And I just thought, yeah. you can't tell a horror story well 200 years ago. You know, we've got, we've come so far in storytelling and you just think, how, how is that going to be any good? But of course it's mm -hmm. good. It's, that's why it's, it's stood the test of time. But anyway, um, it, 1984, I think for just students and understanding, um, especially the, the power of governments and of communities and society and understanding the way that things could evolve. It's very black mirror-y in a sense, um, but so much of it I find very pertinent um, to where the world could be headed. And I just think it's really important for people to, to read something like that. Um, yeah. So that's definitely one of the big ones I've read. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to... Um put a break now because i know if i if i if i keep going and talk about books we will spend the rest of the episode <laughs> on this um and i'll take i'll talk about cs now um a huge uh, part of your life of course but how did it all start were you always interested in it how did you kind of like end up studying it at uni so i enjoyed engineering a lot when i was much much younger um i used to like tinkering with things and taking things apart and breaking things and doing all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff um and I remember one day my dad came up to me because I was just breaking I was just breaking things and turning them into things that were a lot less expensive than what they were before I broke them <laughs> um and he sort of introduced me to coding and coding to me was a way of engineering infinitely you know I didn't need to buy the parts I didn't need to you know I used to go into Maplin and buy all these tiny little components I didn't need to do any of that everything was there and I could create with just a computer and you know it was free kind of once you had a computer yeah. um 
and so I yeah I, I really got into it through that um, I think for a long time I probably would have considered doing engineering um, I just decided I wasn't interested in planes and cars <laughs> and I couldn't think what else there was to engineer so <laughs> um, that's kind of what what dropped me off engineering because I, I wasn't interested in big things um, I was much more interested in robotics and computation so um, yeah I guess that's how I fell into computer science from that and then I kind of like see where that the engineering still like kind of comes through because your most kind of the interested field that you want to pursue as you go on to Cambridge is human robotic interaction. Tell us a little bit about that. What is it and why does it interest you so? So, yeah, a big field of computer science is human computer interaction, um, which is understanding the way in which people interact with machines, both mm -hmm. how they interact with them and how we can improve their interaction. So that's things, a lot of it kind of things like UI design fall under there, user experience falls under mm -hmm. that. Um, and human-robot interaction is, is much the same. It's understanding how people and robots interact, understanding how you can improve that interaction. Um, robots are quite famously a challenging thing to do that with because a lot of people are quite fearful of them. They're very obviously not human. Um, they're quite awkward. I think people associate, a computer is a computer. Um, you can interact with it well, but, but people expect robots to be like people. Um, yeah. And they're not and we're a way off of that um so that's i uh, kind of getting back into robotics was for me super fun i i dropped it it was one of my biggest passions when i was younger but i kind of let go of it because i thought well as a computer scientist i can't i can't do robots now you know i don't know anything about electronic engineering or electrical engineering so i just thought you can't do robotics as a computer scientist or at least a pure computer scientist um, and I then found that actually there are so much more to robotics and computer vision, which is something I'm really interested in, um, which is sort of helping computers to see and understand the world around them. Um, that's a big part of robotics. You know, pe there, I always explain it to people, there are people who build robots and there are people who program robots. And then it, even within those two fields, there are people who just do, you know, joints and there are people who just do head movements and there are people who just figure out how they can fix cameras onto things. And, you know, there are so many different things within robotics. So yeah. um, I realized I didn't have to be an, an amazing electronic engineer who can, you know, whip things up from my kitchen <laughs> to be able to pursue robotics. Cool. And around... Um... In your, was it in your first year with, that you got the Women Tech Maker Scholarship, which is a huge, a very privileged scholarship to get? Um, is that is that right? Was it in your first year? No, that was in my second year. I applied in first year okay. um, and I actually got rejected the first time around. Um, and immediately afterwards, I don't know why, but I just really wanted the scholarship. I was like, this was one thing I was super passionate about getting. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, you know, I, I was just like this would be so cool and as soon as I got rejected I kind of set about doing things that I knew would help me to apply the next year um, and then in second year actually I, I was so busy in first time I just forgotten about it and then I was like Do you know what so many people apply there's just no point don't waste your time I had somewhere in the region of 12 deadlines at the end of term and it's due in in, in early December so I was like no don't don't even go there um, and then on the day it was due, the deadline was due, I was like, no, no, I'm going to apply. I, I'd love to get this scholarship, so I'm going to apply. Um, and I had to email my supervisor um, at Durham and be like, oh, could you send me a reference? And he was like, my kid is ill. I'm not going to get it to you till this evening. And he oh, sent yeah. me the reference at about 10 p.m. at night and it was due at midnight. And I and I couldn't be bothered to start the application until I knew I had the reference because there was no point. So I had yeah. started it about 10 o'clock. Um, so that was a bit stressful. Um, <laughs> but there's a lesson in there. In, you Two know, hours. Always get your application for things. <laughs> yeah, because um, I was this close to not to not applying because I just thought there's no point. You'll never get that. So, um, but yeah, I got it in my second year. Amazing. And what would you say changed um, between that first and second year? Um, yeah. What 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 made you? What gave you the edge the next time around? I think it was. I looked into some of the previous scholars, and the one thing I noticed about them was that you could see everything they'd achieved and they'd achieved some pretty amazing and intimidating things um but i think a lot of people have actually achieved some things that if they just put it somewhere would look very impressive if you actually listed it somewhere other than your cv um, where people can see it and so i at that point was like okay i'm gonna start being more vocal about the things i've done and i i've found a way of doing that whereby you know i keep my my professional life and my personal life very separate um you know linkedin if you want to know all the stuff i've done go to my linkedin um otherwise you probably won't really know things i get up to because i won't tell you um so 
that was one thing of, of setting up a space where I was like, I'm going to be proud of myself in this space. And then everyone else, you know, the people who need to know are on LinkedIn. Everybody else doesn't need to know. And that's kind of how I taught myself to be prouder more, or at least more vocally proud of my achievements. Um, and so, and that was all from looking at these other scholars and going, okay, these girls are not afraid of the things they've done and they're not afraid to shout about the things they've done. So I'm going to try and do more of that um, and, and just, yeah, be own my achievements a lot more than I think I had until that point. And it oddly worked. <laughs> um, wow. That's, that's an really inspiring and really um, an important point for all of us to take because we, as you said, sometimes we're shy and sometimes we don't know where things fit. Like, how do you talk about the fact that you have 325 books in a year, uh, in three years? Um, yeah. Where do you do that? Uh, you, need a, you need a place to out, uh, outlet that. Um, and your CV, I actually sent my CV across a, literally um, yesterday to some someone who was asking. And I'm like, I looked at it. It was the most morose, dead document that I've ever seen. I'm like, who, who, why would you even want to, like, talk to this person? Um, and I think like you you're the perfect example of why someone should be on LinkedIn because I literally just messaged you like Millie I love what you're doing you're just such an amazing person you've had so many amazing achievements along the way and I want you to talk to my students and I want you to share your journey with them um and I've, I've tried to some of my team members are listening and they are also uh they I've forced them to create LinkedIn accounts I've been telling them to share their their stories uh and write about it because at the end of the day you're only going to get picked, you know, you're not going to get picked out for the first first class football team unless you actually show mm-hmm. off what you're doing. Um, mm-hmm. And that's the same for, you know, whether it's jobs, applications, your degree, you need to be like displaying what you have. And it's not just, um, and I really love this bit about you because which is you have this amazing like portfolio of all the CS stuff you do, but you also have this um, other side of you, which you've also showed off because that's what makes you, you, you know, you're the, you're not just a computer science, you're like, you're this person, you also uh, helped set up a charity in the UK, not well set up, but uh, run the whole uh, department for the, the UK side of things for Project Access. Um, and it's, it's kind of combining all these things, which makes you this amazing person and which has led you to not only get your scholarship at uh, the women tech makers, but then went on to get the deep mind scholarship to go to Cambridge. If I'm not like paraphrasing and adding too much of my own flavors, what do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that, that's definitely something I would, um, take away is, is yeah, just talking about things more. Um, and I, 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 we mentioned this before, but talking about how the way you word things is really important. I had to write quite a lot of essays for Google, um, or for the scholarship and, um, I was reading them right before I sent it. And, I, and in a lot of places, I used the phrase, I was fortunate enough to be head of UK for Project Access. Now, yes, I, I will always say luck plays a part in everything you do. Um, but also I'd worked really hard to do that. And I'd spent a year running Durham successfully and had to prove myself and then interview and then got that role. Um, and so I just took that out. And I said, I ran Project Access for a year instead of phrasing it like it was some joke you know I was walking down the street and someone just said would you like to run a charity um I I took away that element of I think inside I still feel like it was a massive fortunate thing but when you're trying to convince people that you know you are worthy of an achievement then to say to act like everything in your life was just a big surprise is not the most confident way of of attacking that particular route so that was definitely something I, I took away reading those essays that night, actually, and thinking, no, I'm going to be more confident and I'm going to own these these things and not act like they were just fell from the sky. <laughs> Coincidences. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so a lot of um, our kind of listeners are, are thinking of applying to computer science to study at university. Um, and obviously, you've not only done your bachelor's, you're heading on to your master's. You've, you've seen the ins and outs of the degree you... I've done really well in that degree as well, <laughs> really, really well. Um, what is, what are the things that you think at at school that we could be doing, um, preparing ourselves for that kind of thing, that kind of degree? And how are you? So, like a lot of for a lot of CS students, they try to do projects and initiatives and try to do that kind of side stuff mm-hmm. um, to show off their kind of skill set. And how do you, so? How do you pick those kind of projects to pursue when you're um, at school or even at university? Um, so I may not be the best example because at my school, I actually deliberately chose not to do computer science A-level. Um, I really wanted to study philosophy and I really enjoyed philosophy and I felt like it would add an extra dimension to me. So I guess the lesson to take away from that would be don't worry about 
um, pigeonholing yourself too early. I mean, the big thing I, I know or certainly was true when I applied was that most UK universities teach you computing from the ground up. So you don't need to be an expert in computer science to study computer science. You don't need to have even, you know, you don't even need to know how to code. Um, and I guess one of the biggest things I would certainly say to people is, yeah, don't worry about having tons of experience. Don't worry about being a whiz in Python or Java or whatever. Um, just do the best you can in school. Certainly grades really matter for computer science, your sort of raw grades. Um, doing projects is beneficial for sure. And it's a great thing to talk about on your um, personal statement and to have that experience of coding. But don't worry too much about it. I mean, one thing that universities are, or some universities certainly don't like it if you've done coding because they teach it to you their way and they want you to do it in their way. So if you've mm. spent a long time learning it your way, um, you can actually often fall short by the time you get to university. So that's something to think about. Um, definitely focus on on maths and physics and, and understanding the way that machines and systems work. Uh, that's super beneficial. Um, read, <laughs> read around the subject, read, um, I'm thinking code by Charles Petzoid was one I read before uni. That's a really interesting one about mm -hmm. computer science. Another favorite of mine is algorithms to live by. That's a fantastic um, uh, sort of, uh, he sort of tells stories about how algor algorithms work in the real world. And he talks about how you would use a bubble sort if you were uh, doing this or how you'd use, um, there's some theory about how many, uh, about probability that, that he talks about how, how you should park in car parking spaces, but it is all these algorithms and how they yeah. how they would work in real life, which is fun and it's a, it's easy to digest if you've not studied mm -hmm. computer science. That's a good one. Um, so yeah, just make sure you love it. Um, don't go if you hate coding. <laughs> so it might be worth trying out before you go. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I didn't take computer science A level deliberately. Um, I didn't know massively. I knew a little bit of Java. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't say it's it's massively important to be like, you know, have a perfect GitHub or anything at that point. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just just find, make sure you're passionate about it for sure. Don't dive in having never touched a line of code because you're probably not if you haven't by that point. Um, but yeah, just enjoy enjoy the journey, I think, of, of learning more about it while you can. So what's, um, what are you most excited about in your master's? Um, I know we're at a weird time and we don't even know what universities are going to be doing yeah. in a couple of months. Uh, but like, what's, what are you looking forward to in your future? Um, I think more learning. I love, like I've, I've said to you, I love to learn. Yeah. Um, if I could do a hundred masters and a hundred bachelors and I would, um, but I think, yeah, mostly just learning from a different group of people. I've mm -hmm. loved it in Durham, but it's going to be great to go somewhere else and pick a whole load more minds um, and be in a different place. Um, and so that's, yeah, I think just more learning <laughs> and gaining information um, for sure. And different Amazing. libraries because Durham is almost maxed out now. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've like drained all the books out of there. <laughs> um, I... I well, we've kind of like had a bit of a break in the in our stream, so I'm not exactly sure of our timing. Um, so I'm just going to round it up right now. Um, and I wanted to get like the massive key takeaway that you've um, you kind of like condensed so much of your experience um, and going through different kind of initiatives and and experiences. What what would you say? Like, what would you like to share with us? That that's a, kind of like a, something that you've learned along the way. I think you kind of stole it from me because you mentioned it earlier. But one thing, <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think my biggest takeaway for people and one thing that kind of changed my life um, was uh, the during my gap year, I spent time working at a, a company and, and a family member of mine really believed in me. And at the time, I had zero self-confidence. I kind of hit rock bottom, didn't know what I was doing. I mm -hmm. didn't know where I was headed. Um, but he really believed in me. I didn't understand why. Um, and then I began to realize that people aren't one thing and people aren't, we, we try usually to be the best at what we do, right? So the best computer scientist, the best mathematician, um, so many people devote their lives to being great at one thing. I think one thing I kind of realized was, was that I was never going to be the best computer scientist. I was never going to be the best mathematician. I was never going to be the best physicist or whatever. Um, and for me, I, I learned over that year of not being in school that people are more, you know, people are holistic beings that have more than one characteristic that makes them who they are. And it sounds really cheesy to say this, um, but it's one of my sort of biggest philosophies that you can create a person who is a multifaceted 
version of all of the things that you are great at. You know, if you read tons of books, right, you have a very unique set of knowledge. No one else probably has read that exact combination of books and only that combination mm. of books. So who you become through the things that you learn and the things that you can do because of the things that you learn is completely unique to you. And that makes you the best at being you. And that's super cheesy, but it's true. Um, and if you can learn how to show off that you are absolutely the best at being you, you know, you do all of these things, you run a podcast, you can run a business with lots of different volunteers um, and you do a maths degree. So that's something that adds, you know, how many people do those two things. It's not necessarily that you've got the best business in the world, or the best mathematician in the world, but who has both of those things alongside everything else that you do. Um, so that's definitely, I think, the biggest thing that I've learned is to to believe in yourself as the best version of you. And as long as you commit yourself to that, then you can't really go wrong. I love it. Uh, it's something that I, I really like believe very strongly as well, to be the best version of yourself. Um, mm. And I I can't say anything, I can't add anything else. That's, 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 the, that's where I want to end it. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Malay. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. It's been lovely. <laughs> and that's all for episode 28. Um, flying by and thank you so much for joining us live and hopefully we'll see you next week bye